And so, uh, to paraphrase the words of the, the French philosopher Eric Cantona, <laughs> <laughs> let us follow the trawler in expectation of sardines and welcome <laughs> Professor Sam Crucian. Thank you very much for coming on a Saturday evening and interrupting your busy lives. And uh, I'm very happy to be in Malta in general. I've been I've had an imaginative connection to Malta for many years, many of students in England. Um, I've never made it here, so I'm very, very pleased to be here. And um, but I've been stuck in a teaching a seminar for the last three days, so tomorrow I'm going to look around. And um, a swim and nice things like that. And what would I say? James, thank you very much for the introduction. James was a brilliant student and uh, I'm very proud to be his PhD advisor. And, um, and also, uh, there's a Clive, Clive Zamet is Clive was also his, his PhD advisor. I'm very happy to see Clive again after all these years. And um, I want to say I've had a, you know, an imaginative connection with with Ivan. It's been I've never the first time the other night. And um, I want to you know the work you're doing with counter-text, all of you is really is a really important journal. I think it's doing very good stuff. And um, so great. And I read a book about football, which I got the American edition with me which is what we think about when we think about soccer. <laughs> so we've got, so I got the American edition because it's, I just had it to hand. And uh, I'm gonna read some bits from it. And um, what would I say? Oh, I don't know. Um, I've been trying to write about things that I love over the years. Uh, things that obsess me, and um, one thing that's joined together my life since I was born is football, and in particular a religious commitment to Liverpool Football Club. And, um, and a lot of the book is about many things, but it's about fandom, it's about all sorts of stuff. So I just get started, but I begin. <coughs> In Moscow. I wrote the preface in Moscow. Let's see what happens there. It's 10 p.m. on Saturday, the 3rd of June, 2017. I'm sitting at a place called the Bowie Bar in Moscow, which bills itself as the home of alternative karaoke. It's really a hangout for Russian hipsters where they can sing exclusively English language songs. I'm in Moscow promoting the Russian translation of my little book. David Bowie. The bar owner, Yevgeny Mialenkov, is giving me free vodka tonics and taking photos of me with various guests. It's a little weird, but he's an interesting fellow, a slice of Brooklyn irony in Moscow. He rolls up his trouser leg and shows me a large red and blue Bowie tattoo on his calf, with the Aladdin saying cover and a ziggy lightning flash. It's a mixture of Bowie and the face of the devil, he explains. He's also shown me lots of Instagram photos from his time as a fiercely loyal Zenit St. Petersburg fan, fan a few years back. But he's got bored with football in the last few years because there's too much money in the game. He prefers basketball. It's more dynamic, he says. I nod silently, say nothing, and sip my drink. While chatting to Yevgeny, I'm watching the Champions League final between Juventus and Real Madrid on a huge TV screen with the sound down. Gazprom advertisements are everywhere. They're, they're the major sponsors for the game, and they're also the money tab for St. in Pittsburgh that enable them to bring in lots of expensive foreign players. I want Juventus to win, because I always love their black and white striped shirts and the defensive resilience of their play. They always seem to lose in big finals, and today is no exception. After a tight, balanced, and exciting first half, Real Madrid impressively turned the screw in the second half and win 4-1 and the ever lovable Cristiano Ronaldo scores twice. 
His second goal is a beauty, following a fast one-touch passing move and nimble cross for the brilliant playmaker Luka Modric. Around me, young Moscovites sing a selection of tunes, some 1980s British nostalgia, The Cure, The Smiths, some classic hip-hop, even some early Queen, which gets a particularly big cheer from the crowd, to my astonishment. As Real Madrid score their fourth goal, an attractive young man in expensive sneakers starts singing Burn the Witch, the opening track from Radiohead's Moonshade Pool album from 2017. He's really giving it everything, but it's a very tough track to sing without Tom York's masterful command of the male falsetto. The lyrics, avoid eye contact, loose talk, seem to score to be consonant with the paranoia of Moscow life I've experienced in, during my visit. And my mind turns to the 2018 World Cup, which will be staged in Russia, with the final at the Luzhniki Stadium in Moscow on July the 15th next year. Part of the reason for this visit was to do some scouting for possibilities and to come back and watch some games. I've got one or two leads. The political ironies of staging the World Cup in Russia at this historical moment are too obvious and legion to point out. And if, that's why I'm telling the story, and if we're looking for an image of the oddity of our age, then the Russian World Cup might prove to be a perfect distillation. Massive structural corruption, both institutional, FIFA and governmental, the Putin regime, the myopic creeping fog of authoritarian nationalist populism, the prospect of serious fan violence, the ever-increasing celebrity culture around major players, and everything overlaid with a glistering pattern of corporate sponsorship, endless advertisements for major brands, and doubtless dreadful sub sub Wagnerian stadium music. It will be ugly. But there will still be beauty, beauty of the players, the splendor of play itself, and the fans and their songs, weird outfits, and flag-coloured face paint. I have no doubt that there'll be a few great games and there might even be some surprises. Who knows, England might not be eliminated in the group stages and maybe Germany won't win. <laughs> of course the Germans will win. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it works. Uh, the first chapter Try and do this about fully over there. The first chapter is called Socialism. What do we think about when we think about football? Football is about so many things, so many complex, contradictory, and conflicting things memory, history, place, social class, gender, in all this trouble variation, especially masculinity, but increasingly femininity too. Family identity, tribal identity, national identity, the nature of groups. <laughs> both groups of players and groups of fans, and the often violent but sometimes pacific and quietly admiring relation between our group and other groups. Football, I'm going to come down this thing. Can't do that. Can you hear me if I come here? Yep, okay. Football is a tactical game, obviously. It requires discipline and relentless training to maintain the fitness of the players, but more importantly, to attain and retain the shape of the team. A team is a grid a dynamic figuration, a matrix of moving nodes, endlessly shifting, but all the while trying to keep its shape to regain its form. A team is a mobile shifting form pitted against another form, that of the opposing team. The purpose of the shape of the team, regardless of possession, regardless of whether you play offensively or defensively, is to occupy and control space. The way a football team tries to control space has obvious analogies with the policing of space or the militarization of space, whether in terms of attack or retreat, occupation or siege. A football team should be organized like a small army, compact, unified, mobile and skilled force with a clear chain of command. As many have said before, football is a continuation of war by other means, but the means of football are clearly bellicose. It's about victory and sometimes heroic defeat. As Bill Shankly, there's a photograph of Bill Shankly there. As Bill Shankly, my boyhood hero and legendary football club manager from 1959 to 1974 said, football is about basic things. Control the ball and pass. Control and pass all the time. 
when controlling and passing is combined with movement and speed, where after each pass there are two or three options open to the player with the ball, then eventually the team with the ball will score. And whoever scores the most goals will win. It's as simple as that. But as the late, the late Johan Cruyff said, playing football is very simple, but playing simple football is the hardest thing that there is. Unlike sports like golf and tennis, or even baseball, cricket and basketball, football is not individualistic. There is no, although there is no doubt that a celebrity-driven star system where players demand and exert ever-increasing amounts of financial autonomy exists, football is not about individual players, no matter how gifted they might be. It's about the team. Football is essentially collaborative. It's about the movement between players who play together and play with and for each other and who make up the mobile spatial web of a team. Now a team can be made up of truly gifted individual players like Barcelona or of less gifted individuals who function together as a fused group, an effective unit of self-organisation where each player knows exactly the role they play in the overall formation of the team. I think of teams like Leicester City in the English Premier League in 2015-16 who really gave football back to the fans. Or teams like Costa Rica in the 2014 World Cup or Iceland in the 2016 European Championship. With teams like that, like those, the whole is clearly greater than the sum of the parts. It's no accident, this is my first philosophical digression, it's no accident that when Jean-Paul Sartre was trying to think about the nature of organisations, he turned to football. The free action or activity, what Sartre calls praxis, of the individual player is subordinated to the team, both integrated into it and transcending it, where the collective action of the group permits the refinement of individual action through immersion in the organisational structure of the team. What's taking place in an organised team is a never-ceasing dialectic between the associative collective activity of the group and the supportive individual flourishing, act, individual, flourishing individual actions of the players, whose being is only given through the team. What continually compels Sartre's attention is how an organisation shapes the relation between individual and collective action in the constantly shifting, dynamic form of a football team. The individual motions of each player are predetermined by their function, being a good goalkeeper, being a decent central defender, holding midfielder or whatever. But these individual functions find elevation and transcendence in the collaborative, creative practice of a team that plays well together. When a team does not play well together, then collective action collapses into its atomized individual parts and the whole thing falls apart. Players blame each other and the fans turn on individual players. This is bad form in all senses. The essentially collaborative nature of football extends to patterns of sociability amongst the players and the contrast between the team that plays for each other and the team that pl where each player plays for themselves the Lionel Messi versus Cristiano Ronaldo dialectic, if you like. To be clear, I'm talking about the formal sociability of a team as a functioning unit, an effective interactive grid. If a team plays well together on the pitch, then they might get along pretty well together off the pitch, but not necessarily. Some of the players in the World Cup winning French team of 1998 apparently never talked off the pitch, and Eric Cantona apparently um, was not that sociable when he totally defined the style of Manchester United's Premier League domination of the 1990s. As with the increase, and also with the increasing multilingualism and cultural range from which the players are drawn, let alone how incredibly young some of them are, I wonder what they talk about and what they have in common. But what matters is the formality of the common football language they speak when they play together. These patterns of sociability find both their echo and their energy in the collective life of the fans. And it's the fans that really interest me, but we'll come back to that later in the book. This sociability ends, extends to the very name of the sport that we're talking about, association football, which abbreviates into soccer 
in the United States, although football was very commonly referred to as soccer in the UK until the 1970s before it was later misunderstood as an Americanism. It's not really. Football is the movement of the socius, the free association of human beings, as Marx said in Capital, although he wasn't talking about football, sadly. The reason why football is so important to so many of us is precisely because of the experience of association at its heart and the vivid sense of community that it provides. To push this a little further and to go out on a limb, we might say that the proper political form of football is socialism. Freedom is not experienced apart from others, but only in and through association, where collective action both integrates and elevates individual action. To quote Bill Shankly once again, but you can find similar sentiments in the legendary Brazilian player Socrates, the Marxist West German 1974 World Cup winner Paul Breitner, or the former Argentinian captain uh, Javier Zanetti. The socialism I believe in, this is Shankly, the socialism I believe in is not really politics, it's a way of living, it's humanity. I believe the way to live and to be truly successful is by collective effort where everyone is working for each other, everyone helping each other, and everyone having a share of the rewards at the end of the day. Brian Clough, who was a regular on picket lines during the minor strike in England in the 1980s, said, for me, socialism comes from the heart. I don't see why certain sections of the community should have the franchise on champagne and big houses. As Barney Roney uh, points out, the majority of premiership clubs have their roots in either a local church or a local pub, a living riposte to the Thatcherite notion that there is no such thing as society. Of course, of course, such socialist statements seem positively ridiculous, laughable, especially when we think of the autocracy and sump of corruption that is FIFA, football's governing body, based in the bourgeois comfort of Zurich. But such sentimentality also seems risible because of the massive and ever-increasing influence of money in football, where players are encouraged, or in many cases compelled, by their greedy agents to act like mercenaries. There's the He's pulling out the Qatar name. Surprise, it's Qatar. <laughs> Clubs are the playthings of the super rich and powerful, where the devotion of fans is greedily monetized and loyalty is taken for granted at every conceivable moment. And here is perhaps the most basic and profound contradiction of football. The form of football is association, socialism, the sociability and collective action of players and fans, yet its material substrate is money, dirty money often from highly questionable, under-scrutinized sources. Football is completely commodified, saturated in sponsorship, and the most vulgar and stupid branding. Think of the endless advertisements during the Champions League, Heineken in the US, Gazprom in Russia, and so on, and the omnipresence of FIFA World Cup sponsors like McDonald's and Budweiser. It's a monetized and sometimes unbearable spectacle of whatever period of capitalism, late, really late, last minute, or even end of days, we're trying to survive through. It can be hideous. And yet I still insist that football is not just that. It is much more. To quote Johan Cruyff again, why couldn't you beat a richer club? I've never seen a bag of money score a goal. Perhaps what brings us together as spectators and lovers of the game is the simultaneous truth and untruth of Cruyff's sentiment. So on the one hand, we require a vigorous and rigorous critique of the corrupt transnational corporate structure of football. This could be achieved through a Marxist analysis of capital flows or power relations in football in the spirit of someone like Foucault. Such a critique must not shy away from the intrinsic connections between football and violence, football and war, football and colonialism, football and racism, football and forms of retrograde and atavistic nationalism, as evidenced in the ugly clash between English and Russian fans in France during the 2016 European Championships, but examples are sadly legion. The need for such a critique is utterly urgent, particularly with the extremely depressing prospect of the next two World Cups being played in Russia and Qatar, 
2018-2022, where clearly both decisions were consequences of the systemic corruption of FIFA. And the systemic corruption of FIFA obviously goes further and further back. I was told by a German friend the other day about how, how Germany won, how Germany bought the, um, the 2006 World Cup with uh, Adidas money and the bags and how that was transferred and all that stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible story. But on the other hand, football also requires a poetics, more focused on form that can attempt to evoke its often powerful and deeply moving beauty. As the Argentine coach, Marcelo Bielsa, an inspiration to some, like Spurs coach Maurizio Pochettino, and a mad genius to others, but a fascinating figure, Bielsa, I found some text by him. Bielsa says, the essence of football is a gesture at the service of beauty. A gesture at the service of beauty. For there is beauty here, the beauty of the players, the effusive green of the grass intersected with crisp geometrical white lines, the beauty of the ever-shifting shapes, interconnecting, interlocking movements, dynamic grids and nodal formations on the pitch, and the beauty of the banners and flags weighed by the fans, and the sound, force and rhythm of their songs. And there is grace, an unforced and at times, at times unwilled movement and elegance, I think obviously of a player like Zinedine Zidane especially as he appears in the wonderful 2006 movie by Philippe Pareno and Douglas Gordon Zidane, portrait of the 21st century. But also when it comes to grace, sheer physical grace, unwilled beauty in movement of players like Roberto Baggio, Paolo Maldini, Thierry Henry, Andrea Perlo or Andres Iniesta. None of those players are English, you'll notice. <laughs> <laughs> But there you go. I also think of the simple grace with which an entire team can move. Say, for example, during the first half of Germany's 7-1 destruction of Brazil at the 2014 World Cup. What was most impressive about that game, if you watch the, the, uh, the highlights on YouTube or whatever, was the simplicity of the German play. Control and pass, control and pass, move into space, receive the ball, shoot, score. Most of the goals in that game are kind of tap-ins. Association football is often called the beautiful game without that thought going anywhere. Why is it beautiful and in what does that beauty consist? In this book, I use the method of what philosophers call phenomenology to try and give some kind of answer to these questions. Phenomenology is a philosophical tradition that begins in the early 20th century in the writings of Husserl, and finds its decisive existential elaboration in the work of Heidegger, Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty. It's very simple. Phenomenology is a description of what shows itself to us in our everyday existence. It's the attempt to bring to the level of reflection what we pass over in our largely and happily unreflective lives. It's the attempt to make explicit what's implicit in our experience. This is why Merleau-Ponty describes phenomenology as relearning to see the world. The phenomenological approach will lead us into the poetics of time, space, drama, and all the elements of what William James calls this mysterious sensorial life that make up the varieties of football experience. And the hope is this approach will enable the reader or listener to see the beauty of football with slightly different eyes. How do we negotiate the contradiction between the need for a critique of football and the possibility of its poetics? Can the conflict between the association and socialism of football's form and the rampant capitalism of its matter be resolved? No, I don't think so. I think this contradiction should be left open, not so much as a dialectic that defies reconciliation as an open wound that we continue to scratch at the beginning of every match, every tournament, every season. Football is a game that compels and delights us to the same extent that it exasperates and disgusts us. Delight and disgust are equally justified reactions to the game and they rotate in each equal measure in every game we watch. That's important to me. It's not that you just like football and it's all great. You like football and you hate football all the time. And that mixture of delight and disgust happens, you know, however many times a day. But in this book, I try and focus, or I focus on the poetics of football. 
to give a poetic evocation of, the fo of football, trying to use this method of phenomenology broadly. And um, I'll read a tiny bit more. Let me know if you get really bored. <laughs> the best thing about this book, it's got pictures in. Uh, I mean, a book with pictures in is always a, a great thing as a writer because it distracts attention from the words. Um, but the pictures are really good. Anyway, I just keep... Anyway, so... What do you think? I could do two things. Maybe I should do that or that. I'm not sure. Football, this is called, what is it like to be a ball? What is it like to be a ball? Football is a game of movement, shape and form, which is neither objective in any naturalistic sense that could be explained away through the procedures of empirical science, nor is it merely subjective. So if we need to desubjectify football, we also need to deobjectify it too. Okay, what I mean by that is that uh, we don't get at the phenomenon of football by looking at what reactions occur in our heads or through what the players say about it. Football is something that takes place in the space of play, out there in the space of play, in a realm that's not subjective, it's not in here, but neither is it objective in any scientific sense, which also means that the football cannot be captured by forms of quasi or pseudo-scientific analysis, like data analysis, um, number of shots recorded, the, you know, the blood sugar levels in the players and all of that. That's not going to get you to what football's about. Football is something between objectivity and subjectivity in this space of play. So football takes place in between the realm of subjects and objects. What I mean by, what I mean by this slightly ugly wording is that football takes place in the space between subjectivity and objectivity that the modern world has spent so much time trying to rigidify notably in Kant's laborious, admirable, but ultimately questionable critical project. To borrow the jargon of the influential French philosopher and formal, former naval officer, Michel Serre, football takes place and is played in the Middle Kingdom. Football takes place in the Middle Kingdom. And it's played by quasi-objects and quasi-subjects namely players who are not defined by their subjective intentions in a game that is not explained by objective causal powers. In order to understand the phenomenon of play, we do not just need to get out of our heads in our obsession with psychology, consciousness and inner states. We also need to grant a certain life to the things that fill the field of play, for they are far from being lifeless, inanimate objects. If we locate football in this middle kingdom between subjects and objects, the space of player, play in the in-between, then this gives us a way of approaching the peculiar mixture of reality and unreality that defines the experience of a football match, and with which we're utterly familiar, even if that familiarity is rarely made explicit. In other words, football takes place in the realm of fantasy, in the strong psychoanalytic sense. Fantasy is neither make-believe, it's not subjective delusion, nor is it objectively real. It is that which structures and saturates what we think of as everyday life, a life which finds a particularly intense articulation in the phenomenon of football. For example, think about the moment when you enter a major football stadium, if you've ever had that great good fortune, like Arsenal's Emirates Stadium in North London, or the Stade de France in Saint-Denis, just outside Paris. You enter the ground, try and orientate yourself, walk through wide, windowless concrete halls lined with overpriced concession stands, then you walk up the steps towards the daylight, or even better, floodlights to find your seat. And then you see the pitch and the entire stadium, shining, gleaming. It's real, but too real, hyper-real, almost too much. It's like watching a movie in an entirely immersive 360-degree sensorium. 
It's real and unreal at once. We do not feel inside our heads, but out there in the Middle Kingdom. It's the empire of the senses, the realm of the in-between. Sensei ecstasy. We're here under the spell of William James's mysterious sensorial life. Which is to say, interestingly, philosophically, there is no immediacy to football. There's no immediacy to football. No direct access to a realm of pure subjectivity or objectivity. Every aspect of football is mediated. And mediation is not some falling away from a purported immediacy, but the very way in which the phenomenon is presented. In other words, football is mediation all the way down. Which, of course, is Hegel's insight, right? That's dialectics. That's what you're watching when you're watching the premiership. The truth of Hegel's thoughts about mediation. We're completely aware of that. We're completely comfortable with that. That's what we're doing when we're watching a game. Last bit. I talk about uh, the, 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 there's a chapter called Stupidity, which where I talk about how stupid football is and how, stu how important it is to be stupid and that stupidity is the stupidity of you know belief also the stupidity of fascination that you know you can just be you know why do I like the Uruguayan national team because they have blue and white striped shirts and black shorts I just like the colors that's really stupid and on that basis I'll extrapolate a whole story about Uruguay which is a great story, but it begins with the stupid realize oh, that that's nice, that that looks good. And it's often like that with people that develop intense, complex passions for football teams. It begins because they like the colours of their shirt. And that is something stupid but important. Next chapter is called Intelligence. And I'll read a little bit of it. The beautiful stupidity of being a football fan is linked to The beautiful stupidity of being a football fan is linked to what Gadamer calls the tragic pensiveness that overcomes the spectator at a drama in the ancient theatre. This is what I was doing with the European graduate school people a bit today, that's why I want to read it. I think something similar happens in football. The spectator has a pensive distance from the game, a theoretical or aesthetic distance, which is the spectator's mode of participation. This does not mean that spectators hold themselves aloof from the action, but participate in it by being there present and constantly attentive. This could be pushed a little further, namely that the spectator is not in the service of the players or secondary to them. On the contrary, I think the spectator is the superior party to the parity of the players on the pitch. The spectator is, if you like, an umpire, a word which derives etymologically from non pair a non-peer, one who is not the equal of others. As Hegel might have said, again, if he had, the, had had the good fortune to think about football, the being of the players is not being in itself, but being for us, mediated through the spectators and requiring, requiring their recognition in order to affirm the player's existence. That's why a game played in front of fans has no meaning. Right? As happened, uh, as can happen sometimes. Or if it has a meaning, it has a different kind of meaning. So the game that was played without fans in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago. With that in mind, we can expand Sartre's thought proposed earlier on. It's true that the free activity of the individual player is subordinated to the collective action of the team, both integrated into it and trans transcending it through the organizational structure of the team. But this collective action or praxis is mediated at a further level through the theoretical gaze of the spectator. That is, it's only through the theoretical recognition of the collective praxis of the team by the spectators that the totality of the team can be apprehended as such. Football gives us an apprehension of totality as mediated totality. The totalization of the team, and indeed the opposing team and the match as a whole, is only granted by the spectators. In simpler terms, the players play, but only the fans see the whole picture.
Now, although the spectators have chosen to submit to the beautiful stupidity of football, they're possessed of a great intelligence. They know how the game goes and they know how it will probably end. The players lose themselves in play. If they're playing well, they're lost in the throw and the throws of the match. But the spectator is a thing apart, participating at an absolute distance where they absolve themselves from the frenzied, frenzied activity on the pitch. Sometimes spectators feel happy if their team is winning handsomely and feel wildly, if briefly, ecstatic if they score a goal. But often we watch with a sense of foreboding. Pensive distance can be an anxious distance. Picking up on a thought by the classicist Mary Lefkowitz, the role of the spectator is analogous to that of the gods in ancient tragedy. Observing the action, watching it play itself out with the foreknowledge that what is played out is not sheer contingency or a game of chance, but part of the larger machination of fate. Football, I think, is largely about fate. In ancient drama, the gods appeared on a theatrical device like a crane above the stage, like spectators in a cosmic stadium. Often the players appear like the playthings of fate, unable to affect the course of the drama and alter its often tragic end, despite their intense exertions. For me, this is particularly the case watching England during a major international tournament. Just think about it for a second if you've had that misfortune. Players fruitlessly buzz about. The ball is endlessly passed side to side across the pitch or back to the goalkeeper. Attackers are either weirdly static or they run into space where the ball will never come. A tangible spread, sense of fear spreads among the players and infects the fans with loathing. The greater the physical effort, the more the players seem to be caught in a spider's web of doom. It's like watching Lucky's psychotic dance in Act One of Beckett's Waiting for Godot, that Pozzo calls the net. And the fans have the foreknowledge of all that comes to pass and sink back in their seats, feeling stupefied and let down. In fact, it's even worse than that, because for as long as there's still time in a game, a few minutes of injury time left, we can still hope. The worst thing about football is not the disappointment. It's not the disappointment that kills you, it's the ever-renewed hope. Right? It's the hope that's unbearable. <laughs> Losing, you know, your team is shit and you're gonna lose. That's easy. But your team is shit and you're gonna lose, but you still hope they're gonna win. That's the terrible thing. And that's what you can't, you know, you, Watch England, you know what's going to happen, and it always happens. And still, some corner of you is thinking, it might not happen. <laughs> and it does. And so it's, it's, the, it's, the, and it's the, the kind of, the wisdom of the fans that interests me. The worst thing about football, being a football fan, especially an England fan, is that horrible, poisonous cocktail of foreknowledge and hope. I then talk about Brecht, uh, which I'll spare you. I then talk about the fans and how I give a number of very unpleasant examples of how fans abuse each other, which I won't read out because it's really unpleasant. Well, maybe just one. <laughs> the, <you> know, <laughs> So, you know, the Liverpool fans will sing songs about the Munich air disaster and Manchester United fans will sing songs about the Liverpool, the Hillsborough, you know, always the victims, always the victims. And this, and then you've got the racism of the chance and all of that. So football is awful, bigoted, nasty, racist and stupid. But <laughs> having said that, Football fans are not just a collection of dumb hooligans, simple-minded nationalists, or rabid fascists, not at all. Nor are they quasi-Nietzschean quasi participants in some sacral ritual communion. They're an intelligent, often hugely well-informed and critical crowd, even if they're often given to extremes of tastelessness and the licentious kanja of paresia, of freedom of speech. They're often expert in their knowledge, relaxed, 
in their opinions and never afraid to make an umpire's judgment if a player is particularly good or lazy or a coach makes a tactical error. They're an audience that's capable of totality, of seeing the whole picture. This is why Brecht, when he was thinking about the audience for his theatre, wanted a sports crowd, because they were relaxed and they could see the whole picture. I'm always hugely impressed by the intelligence of football fans. As much I'm as I'm depressed by the ignorance of those who fail to appreciate their wisdom and dismiss it as dumbness. In my view, football is a profound example of discursive rationality. Indeed, perhaps football is the only area of human activity where German philosopher and social theorist Jürgen Habermas is right. <laughs> in his claim about the consensual nature of communicative action and the force of the better argument. We support our team and have good reasons to do so, but so do fans of other teams. There are two features I'd like to draw attention to in closing here about intelligence. Firstly, the rationality of the arguments amongst fans of the same team. I spent hours, days, weeks and years talking with fellow Liverpool fans, arguing about the form of the team, the transfer policy, the squad selection, the variety of tactical formations, usually linking this to the history of the team, its traditions, its, glorious, its glories and its glorious failures. When we meet a fan of the same team, there is not just some kind of fatic communion where the hearer is bound to the speaker through all sorts of nonverbal cues like yelps and grunts. You just go, oh, yeah, yeah, Liverpool, yeah. No, we talk. We find out how much they know and what sort of fan they are. You sniff around another fan. You find out how serious they are. You try with some questions and vice versa. If you meet a serious fan, this happens a lot, then you listen to arguments with evidence to which counter-arguments with counter-evidence can usually be provided. So it goes back and forth, often for very long periods. With a seriousness which is playful, this is a game after all, but still deadly earnest. Indeed, we can change our minds about some deeply held, passionate conviction about our team. I've experienced this a thousand times with people of every gender, of all ages, including adolescents and kids, in fact, often with kids who frequently have a deeply honest, intuitive appreciation of the game. You can have a really, you can have a really decent conversation about football with a 10-year-old. Rational arguments back and forth. Football lays out easy tram lines for talk and can shift from word to word between the inane and the intellectual and back again. And that interests me. The second feature is the experience of talking with supporters of other teams, perhaps teams we publicly despise because they are the enemy, like Manchester United. Surprising as it may seem to me, even Manchester United fans have their reasons for supporting them. <laughs> even they have their preciously held traditions, histories and folklore. After all, the last time Liverpool won the English League was in 1990, and United have won it no less than 13 times since that date. Lucky for some. The pain that I feel in response to that fact is tempered with respect, and there are good reasons why it happened. It's not chance. The point is that we can listen to the fan of an enemy team, hear their arguments, listen to their reasons, and even change our mind. In my humble opinion, football talk can even be a paradigm for moral behaviour and discussion. If only other areas of life were at once so reasonable and yet so subtended by deep abiding passion and belief. That's the thing about football. Football is obviously a game of passion and emotion, but it's a game of reason. And the passions that we have are not irrational. They're passions which are tempered by reason and are open to listening to reasons. And other people have those passions too. We don't consider them morons for having those passions. We listen to their reasons and we go back and forth. Of course, we might wonder why this is the case. Why is it that conversations about football should simultaneously possess the usually mutually exclusive properties of rationality and faith? Why is it that, in relation to football, I can exhibit both a powerful, tribal, visceral loyalty to my team at the same time as showing respect for the enemy, and where the force of the better argument can permit both parties to change their minds? Is it the, the admission of the basic presupposition of playfulness which permits the seriousness of debate? 
Is it easier for us to discuss seriously when we know that we're only talking about a game? Right? It's a question I have. Is it because of the playfulness that the seriousness is possible? I don't know the answers to these questions, but it's striking that when discussions about football and maybe sports in general are compared to discussions in, if you compare them to discussions in philosophy and politics. In politics, clinging to our deeply held prejudices in the face of counter-arguments is perhaps not so surprising. Not that it's necessarily a good thing. But I remember the, the philosopher Bernard Williams saying that during his long and distinguished academic career, he'd only witnessed a philosopher changing their mind on one occasion. Right? So Bernard Williams, who spent a lot of time with philosophers, experienced a philosopher changing their mind on one occasion. The occasion was, was when during a British government inquiry into the nature and causes, nature and effects of child abuse, when the appalling evidence of paedophile pornography had led a moral philosopher to revise their opinion about the need for new parliamentary legislation. I spent my entire academic career listening to people give papers, thousands of them. On no occasion that I can recall did the response to a speaker take the following form. Dr. Smith, thank you for your completely convincing talk. You were right, I was wrong. It never happens. Yet in relation to the unserious stupidity of football, it happens a lot. And isn't that peculiar? So the, the, the thought I'm developing there is that there's something serious about play uh, and there's something about the playfulness of play which allows us to engage in different forms of seriousness which are absent from our other areas of life, like our political commitments or our intellectual, let alone our religious commitments, which are not perhaps up for grabs. And so football for me is um, all of that. So how would I put it? So that, um, what I discovered in thinking about this topic was that there are lots of things that I would like to be true philosophically. Um, and the only place where they are true is in football, which either means that the things that I want to be true are pretty stupid or wrong, or there's something about football that is uh, revealing. It, it shows a whole range of phenomena up, and that's the view, obviously, I want to argue for. That's all I've got to say, and thank you very much for listening. differently after this. We've got some time for uh, questions and discussion. Um, let me see if I can get the microphone to, to work, but start formally. <coughs> oh, I should have used that. Right? No, it's, it's, it's <coughs> not working anyway. All right. It's my thing for that. I'm a Liverpool fan, I can see how your vision of football is very much um, based on a very specific way of looking at football. Right. Um, one, one question, I mean, there's so much to discuss, but yeah. it's so thought provoking. One question I have is what do you think about those moments <coughs> when the inside and outside of the stadium is broken? So I'm thinking, for instance, of pitch invasions. Yeah. by supporters. It was a recent match in England against Morton. One fan actually broadcasted live on Twitter. Right? So got a number of likes. Once he got a number of likes, he went and did it. And people were watching him and commenting. Mm -hmm. And the resistance to that happening the other way around. So, mm -hmm. for example, mid-1990s, Robert Fowler protested had a, had a shirt, Liverpool style, had a shirt, for those who may not know, and with a um, sign in support of the dockyard right. workers yes, sir, and exactly. strike, and he got you know, punished for that. And, mm -hmm. and, and football is very strict about this, that mm -hmm. players cannot in any way make any political comments um, mm -hmm. or, 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 or signs during, during the match. So those moments when this inside and outside yeah. um, is, is broken. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's, um, uh, 
Uh, I've got a photograph here of a, a naked Liverpool fan. You can't see it. It's a one person pitch invasion, which I rather like. I don't know what the tattoo is there, but it looks. But I think pitch invasions are kind of funny. I think when they're like that, they're, they're sort of funny. And um, I am. Um, um, you know, it, obviously it can turn nasty. What happened in Egypt a number of years ago, you know, it really was unpleasant. So, um, and also when you think about the, um, the terrorist attacks in Paris in November the other year, and that was began outside the Stade de France. That's another way the outside-inside thing breaks when there's a, something happens outside the stadium and the inside the stadium reacts. There is that. I think that... Um, but so I think those inside-outside moments are really interesting. And it, re it reveals a very interesting point about law. Because what is football? Football is, you know, football has always been played. A ball has been, a ball has been kicked around by the feet in China, in you know, Latin America for you know, thousands of years. But it was codified as a body of laws in, uh, in the British Isles in the 1870s, 1880s, and the highest governing body of football, which is something that I didn't realize until about 18 months ago, because of a very good talk I heard by two young Irish uh, scholars, is something called the International Football Association Board. Uh, and FIFA are subordinate to the International Football Association, and they decide the laws, and those laws are published every few years, a huge revision came out before the European Championships in May last year. So there is law, and that body of laws, there are 17 laws of the game, are very clear. And um, it goes right down, the law goes right down to what colour underwear a player can wear underneath their shorts. Right? So if you're wearing white shorts, you play for Real Madrid, you can't wear black underwear. That's forbidden by law. That's the degree of detail. On the other hand, law is something continually bent in football. So in a sense, there's both the football is only possible because of the presence of the law. And once there's the presence of the law, then the game can be played in accordance with those laws. And then those laws, but those laws have this malleability. So one thing I talk about in the game, talk about in the book, is cheating, cheating. And uh, how we understand cheating, what kind of thing cheating is, and why we like cheating so much. You know, so if you're Uruguayan, right, um, and you're a fan of Luis Suarez, you know what he did in the World Cup was it 2010 when he he saved the he, he, you know he was sent off um, he saw, sent off the handball it was a penalty to Ghana and then um, the, the the Uruguayan goalkeeper saved the, the goal Uruguay went through you know win at all costs or the way in which say you know. Italian defenders will uh, deal with uh, opposition. There was, there was a game in the European Championship last year where Chiellini just, just trod on somebody. And in slow motion, you saw it. Yeah, and the hand of God, too. So, in a sense, there's something about law and transgression going on in football where you need the presence of the law, but it's the transgressions which are really important. That, that bending and malleability of law is what football is about. And we enjoy that. I think similarly with um, the politics of football, right? I mean, if I, you know, I, I argued the point at the beginning that football is socialism, which is obviously a provocative thing to say. I'm just riffing off the idea of association, but you know, there's something to be said for it, which is obviously a political statement, right? So, um, why shouldn't footballers be allowed to express political opinions? I, I have questions about that. Why shouldn't teams because teams do express political opinions. Obviously at this point, historically, Barcelona, although they've been quiet about it in a way, but Barcelona are, have a certain explicit relationship to Catalonian nationalism. Right? So, um, so in a sense, football is obviously political. And I don't think necessarily the football players should be engaged in constant political protest, but I'm not opposed to it when it happens. It usually happens for a very good reason.
Nice thing. Questions, thoughts? What I don't like is all this thanking God business. <laughs> you know, I've noticed that the creeping into football of, you know, all footballers thanking God. I mean, you know, whose side is he on? <laughs> because if there were a God, you know, and presumably if you're a God, then he'd be fair to everybody. It means every match is going to be a draw. So, unless God is, you know, supporting some football team that we don't know about. But that doesn't seem to be. So I find that, you know, it's that particular with Brazilian players in particular, that's changed in a generation. They've gone from a generation of, say, Socrates, who was a kind of, you know, socialist character to something very different. Anyway, Ivan, sorry. Thanks for that. Um, Barcelona and their motto of more than a football That's club. Yeah. Uh, that more than a football club and um, the idea in the sense that possibly is there underlying in your paper that um, this is about more than football. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so Barcelona then becomes a very interesting example of this because of what we've pointed out with very the case. Uh, Catalan thing, but also become, because it becomes the focus for the Johan Cruyff philosophy and the idea that there can be a philosophy of football uh, which can travel, which can have legacies, which uh, becomes poeticized by Cruyff, he actually writes about it. And um, suddenly you can you can just cover why um, in those conditions um, football can become something that can hold philosophy's gaze, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but there is this this thing as well that if to follow up on Mario, we read we read football and the link with philosophy and so on through through clubs then I guess our reading and our interpretation can be fueled in certain ways if we approach all this through the history, for example, of Napoli football club, it's going to be different. If you approach it through Celtic football club, it's going to be different. And then, of course, there are myths and legends and the idea of the team that was composed exceptionally of people all born within five miles of park head, all of that becomes yeah. uh, feeds into feeds into certain narratives. Mm -hmm. the, the question is, I guess, at what um, at what point uh, to to what extent can we take seriously the idea of, of obviously we must you know of this, this thing about more than football and reading into it something like the fact that Barcelona played beautiful football, mm -hmm. uh, lovely patterns and so on, but the beauty is also a consequence of the fact that there is a lot of money mm -hmm. and that the beauty is um, there in a sense despite or because of something like the corruption mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in football. I completely, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's so, a disturbing thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then perhaps, perhaps a further question is, what is the specificity of football, would you say? You've already ind indicated one or two things in your paper on this. What is the specificity of football as a uh, as a sport that can hold the gaze of philosophy perhaps more than other sports in a way that, for example, I just mentioned a sport I'm interested in, uh, athletics, track and field count, when, when um, on the surface it could seem like it gives so many suggestive metaphors, the loneliness of the long distance runner mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah um, that's good. It's good. I mean, the, the thing about money is yeah, I mean, it's just true. The um, uh, beauty comes at a price. And, mm. you know, Barcelona sold Neymar in the summer, and we know, and they haven't been investigated by Paris Saint Germain, have not been investigated because of the, uh, the 
the weakness and corruption of UEFA, and you know the whole thing is a mess. So all of that is true. In a sense, the what interests me about football is the the compromised nature of our enjoyment of it. Right? We're watching something, we're liking it, and we feel awkward about liking it because where'd the money come from? Right? Who's paying the bills? And I think what you've seen in the emergence of particularly in European football in the last 10 years, particularly in, um, particularly in England, is you know, new forms of ownership um, and sponsorship where you can have you know, an owner from Thailand and with a club from like, Leicester and, then, and that still works. Again, one, one thing that interested me, and this, this, is, this is a very old example, but when I was growing up, <coughs> Arsenal were the Irish team. In, in London, the London Irish team. So uh, most of their players were Irish, or second generation, and most of their fans were, had an Irish connection. That was the, the deal with Arsenal. Then that changed, uh, Arsene Wenger came in, and then Arsenal becomes a place where young French players, many of them of African descent, end up playing in France. And then I remember being in a pub in about 2002, 2002, so it's a long time ago, in, um, in Hackney, which was an Irish pub, during an Arsenal game, and the the guys who were the same guys that would have been there earlier were saying, hey, "Come on, Thierry, you know, it was exactly there was no problem. Go on, Robert, Robert Perez." So in that sense, there's something about mal there's a malleability that you can still have a club which has an incredibly strong identity through the fans, and all this other stuff can be stretched and uh, and changed. I mean. We'd have to go case by case. It's um, it's it, it it's difficult because you've got clubs. I mean, you mentioned um, Barcelona, obviously, who are very interesting. Napoli is another interesting example, and they're doing so well this season. Or Celtic, you know, um, Celtic, where uh, with such a powerful local fan base and a very specific kind of political identity of representing what it means to be Catholic and often Irish in, in a largely Protestant Scotland and um, all of that stuff and the there's a way in which football can adapt to money adapt to new situations and uh, take the worst of what's happening and still, and that's all disgusting, as I said at the beginning, there's a disgust there, still there's a, a delight and a joy and a beauty. Uh, I don't know whether that should make us feel good or make us feel, make us feel bad. Um, what is it about football that holds the gaze of the philosopher? I don't know, I mean, it, it holds my gaze because, um, I mean, the um, <coughs> football was, as with many people, of many people, but then maybe particularly people of say my generation, um, you had no idea what to talk to your parents about. There were just these people that said they were your parents and <laughs> went on holiday with them once a year if you were, you know, but these complete strangers who claim to have given birth to you. The only thing I could talk to my father about was football. It was the only thing where there was some some common interest and some and some rational back and forth. We'd have long arguments about football. None of us would lose, neither of us would lose our temper, but we had clear opinions about things. And that's and that's something about that which interests me. But that could happen with other sports too. With football, I think it's the collaborative nature of football, and it's obviously it's history in relationship to its sedimented kind of embeddedness in in largely forms of working class life, largely forms of working class urban life in the 19th century. So obviously with that as a nostalgia, mm. right? So with teams like Liverpool, that's obvious. But most of the fans of Liverpool, from Liverpool perhaps have never been there. Why would you go there? It's, it's a horrible place. I mean, <laughs> well, it's not that bad. The weather is terrible. The best to stay in Malta, you know, and support Liverpool. Maybe we should move the ground here. That would be. And that's also why why the ground. I mean, why there's there's something really mysterious, right? I mean, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, a Liverpool fan tomorrow. 
a great team under the, the visionary coaching of Mauricio Pochettino, you know, student of Marcelo Biesa, who is a really interesting figure, I think. And the team move ground. They move a few miles away to Wembley and their play changes. What is it about the material structure of a pitch, a stadium, that would change things? There's no objective basis to that, right? It makes no sense. But when teams change ground, the nature of the club changes because the relation to the fan shifts and that affects the team. And so another thing that I pick up in the book which interests me is that even when you've got teams with players who got are doing it for money, right? Because they're from usually from relatively impoverished backgrounds in other parts of the world, let's say, um, you can um, an, an ethos about a club can, can function like a kind of living archive. And the fans are a kind of living, uh, like a living kind of library of that, that club. And that is communicable. That's the strange thing. That's communicable somehow to players who've got no history with that club and with a coach that's got, you know, maybe just started that job recently. And that's kind of a weird thing about football, I think. Um, I think what makes it different from, say, track and field is, and other sports, um, baseball obviously, but you know, um, less so basketball. It also, the thing I said about football, which is why watching football in the United States is sometimes, sometimes irritating, because uh, when I watch games, I don't make much noise, right? And there's this great book by Peter Hanke called The Goalkeeper's Anxiety at the Penalty Kick. And uh, the, the protagonist in the book, who's a kind of lunatic, says um, a good game goes very quietly. And there's something about that. There's something about the, the almost kind of the meditative quietness of the game. And, and you react, but you react in odd ways. Whereas you've, we're watching, I'm watching in New York and someone goes, great shot! <laughs> Didn't go in. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kick the ball. Of course, going to kick the ball. Just be quiet. Just watch the game. Watch the game and be quiet. You know, and there's a kind of there's a kind of meditative quality that watching football has. And when you're doing that with someone else, other people, it's it's interesting what happens. And that, um, and also the fact that sometimes nothing can happen. It could be like you know, waiting for Godot where yeah, nothing yeah. happens twice, you know, and the, the way in which, you know, a nil-nil a nil draw in an Italian Serie A game can be just a beautiful thing, because two teams cancel each other out. It's like watching mechanisms move. It's, that's not exciting in any obvious way, but it's a thing of extraordinary beauty, I think. So I think what I like about football is also it's, sometimes it's, it's, it's apparent tedium. Mm -hmm. And you give yourself over to those rhythms, and you begin to watch and be pulled in. <coughs> Who needs goals? <laughs> Final question. Um, yeah. No. No. Nobody. Come on. This is intro time before the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi. Hello again. Okay, that's a very, that's a very good point. Okay. Well, that that should change, um, or, it should, or that may that, that may should stop, but it should change because one of the things that's been very interesting. Again, 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 one of the one of the really good things about being in the, you know, a place like New York and watching football is that um, football, soccer is. Um, uh, a participant sport largely and 
The US men's team did not qualify famously for the World Cup last week. They lost to Trinidad and Tobago, but the women's team have won the World Cup three times. So the level of women's football is incredibly high in the US because it goes through the college system. You've got people, that, women that go to college, they play soccer, they play soccer at a very high level. So in that context, the, the gender dynamics of soccer are very different. And um, so I would say if I go to you know, my local place uh, where I live to watch a game, um, it's going to be about 60, 40 male, female. And there'll be a lot of women there on their own who are just watching because they, they, they follow Tottenham. And that's, um, or whoever it might be. And that's really changed, I think. I think, I think what, we're, what we're, I'm not going to be a kind of, uh, you know, totally optimistic about this, but the Norwegian, the Norwegians decided to pay their female and male players, international players, the same wage this, this week. And the Swedish and Danish teams are kind of threatened to go on strike because of that. And we'll see. But I think that's going to happen. So I think the development of um, the development of women's football is 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 a is a powerful thing, and it's um, it really is changing the way the game takes place. But I think quite separately to that, I think there's been a, a real shift, maybe not in Malta, but um, uh, a real shift in the the masculinity around football behaviour in my opinion. And it's very, and there's a kind of, um, I, I'm very hopeful about that. It's one of the areas where I really think that rational discussion, it isn't a kind of, when I'm talking about rational discussion between spectators, I'm not talking about guys just kind of, you know, hugging each other. It's, I, I, I find that I find that across <coughs> the genders and across the ages as well. You find that with uh, with kids and all sorts. Of, it's fantastic in that way. So I'm a little bit. But then again, you know, lots of stupid things happen around football. I'm not denying that, and it is stupid, and it's um, commodified and disgusting and cheap and tawdry and corrupt. And it, um, and of course, it you know it, diver it diverts people from more important things in life, right? There's that it, it, it occupies a lot of time when people could be doing more important things, but nonetheless, it's um, something else. Not something else. It's um, there's no way of justifying football philosophically. Basically, it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's a no, it's a pointless. You can't defend it. it, you know, it It will ruin your life. <laughs> you just end up watching games and then talking about it. And then it's, yeah, so I do, yeah, I do think I've gone too far with this book. So I, I, <laughs> urge, you, I urge you not to, not to read it or buy it, but don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that sales pitch. <laughs> Um, I'd invite you all to stay behind for, for a drink. We can continue the conversation of the glass of wine. But before then, please join me in thanking Simon Critchley for an interesting <laughs>